This week, Sean McEachern reels him in. The NHLPA presents Be a Player. Brought to you by EA Sports NHL 2002. If it's in the game, it's in the game. Welcome to Be a Player of the Hockey Show. I'm Brett Linderos, coming to you from Boston, and more specifically, the Boston University campus. Now, the BU Terriers men's hockey team here has been the start of many NHL careers, including Keith Kachuk, Tony Amani, Tom Pody, Scott Young, and our guest this week, Sean McEachern of the Ottawa Senators. Now, native to the Boston area, Sean is going to take us out deep sea fishing. Hopefully, we'll have some luck. I'll also give you an inside look at the U.S. men's Olympic hockey team as they prepare to host the world in Salt Lake. But first, here's part one of my visit with Sean McEachern. McEachern, Alfredson heading for the net. McEachern shoots, he scores! Here's McEachern's shot, score! To the shot, Rousseau into the goal, they score! McEachern on the rebound! A strange We're in an Olympic year, so let's start there. Back in 1980, when the U.S. won the gold medal in the Olympics, what kind of effect did that have on you, even though you're only 11 years old? Oh, it was huge. I mean, uh... I think anybody from Boston, especially, it was uh, four or five guys from Boston on the team. And, you know, I grew up rooting for the U.S. team like that, especially beating the Russians. I think it brought out a lot of hockey players in Boston. My dad had season tickets to the U games, and we actually saw the guys from the team on the ice show off their gold medals, and uh, it was pretty exciting. You were drafted by Pittsburgh while you were still in high school and then spent three years at BU. You joined the 92 Olympic team. What are some of your fondest memories from that experience? I think probably my biggest memory is just playing in the games, being a part of the Olympic experience. I think that's the biggest thing. Getting a chance to play against the Russians. We've got like Zamnoff on the team and Kasparaitis, and they had some great players. Back into the plane, they're going to McEachern. He shoots and scores. Sean McEachern. I was a pretty lucky guy to hook on with the Penguins right after the Olympics and uh, get a chance to play Marlon Mew and Kevin Stevens and Jaeger and all these guys. And to win a Stanley Cup, I probably didn't appreciate it as much then as I do now. Uh, but uh, it, was a, it was a highlight of my career. There are your champions for 92. Your rookie season, you play every game, you score 60 points, and they trade you. How did you deal with that? That was uh, the first time you get traded. It's pretty tough to take, I think. Uh, it was a pretty exciting year. We won the President's Trophy that year, and I thought probably the best team I ever played for was that team. But the Islands beat us out in the, in the playoffs that year. And, um, and actually, I started in the news the first time. The first time I traded, because they couldn't get a hold of me. I was up at the beach. And uh, it was a pretty big surprise. The first time you get traded, def definitely a different experience. Earlier in your career, you bounced around a little bit. You had a few trades. Now it seems like you found a home in Ottawa. Is it nice to be able to put down some roots? Yeah, I'm glad I stayed in Ottawa for the last uh, five years. And um, especially where I have kids now, I think it's, it's great for them to have friends and be able to keep going back to the same place and not have to worry about moving. I enjoy the city and uh, that's one of the reasons I stayed there. I think it's a safe place and uh, a nice place to raise a family. The thing about playing in Canada is that the, the main emphasis is hockey and it's real important to the fans and I think that makes it real important to the players. I think you, you really uh, focus on the games and it's fun to be part of that. Last year you scored your 200th NHL goal and I read that you didn't keep the puck. Why? Yeah. I, yeah. What was up with that? I, I didn't keep the puck because um, I always feel like if you keep the puck, you might not score anymore. You know, I think it's bad luck. So I didn't keep the puck I scored my first goal with, and I, I haven't kept any since. I just, um, I don't want to keep scoring. I don't, I don't want to jinx myself. Over the past two seasons in Ottawa, it seems like a lot of the attention has been focused on Alexei and his situation. Are you glad to see that situation resolved for both parties? Well, the thing is, Yash is a quiet guy, and he's, uh, he's an easy guy to have on your team. He works hard and scores 40 goals every year, so I enjoyed when he was there. But um, he held out that year, and I think the fans really get sour on that. And um, It's probably the best for him that, that he get traded, but they got a great deal. I think Charles is really going to help us out a lot. He's a big guy and tough, and he can really play physical against the other team's best players. And a guy like McCall, I think he's a right winger, and I think he's real good in the corners and uh, can score some goals. I think he scored 20 goals as rookie year. And uh, Spets is supposed to be a, a big talent coming up. The last few seasons, the Senators have been at the top or near the top of your conference. It seemed like the regular season is a cakewalk. You get into the playoffs, and all of a sudden there's a little bit of trouble. What does your team need to go further in the playoffs and achieve your goal of the Stanley Cup? Well, I think. Um, 
You know, I think one of our problems has been in the past we've had young team and guys are just getting used to playing the playoffs and stuff like that. You know, maybe we need a little bit more toughness. The guys have to play through things, maybe a little harder through some of the physical play. I think Toronto really, uh, that was their plan to play physical against us and it seemed to work. But, you know, we get great players on our team, with guys like Marion Hosa and Marty Havlat and young guys coming up and, and Pat Aline's a great goalie for us and uh, I think this year should be a different story. McEckern. It's now time for Be A Player Trivia. To play, send your answer to NHLPA.com slash Be A Player. All correct answers will be entered in a random draw with a chance to win an NHL 2002 game courtesy of EA Sports. All other correct responses will be entered for a chance to win an autographed NHLPA jersey. For complete contest rules, visit NHLPA.com and click on Be A Player. Which two rookies led their teams in scoring last season? Pete Peters, next on After the Game. This is kind of the lifestyle that we wanted to bring our children up in. I thought I'd take a stroll in the oldest park in the United States, Boston Common. This 40-acre area of land right in the heart of downtown Boston was set aside in 1634 and was originally used as cow pasture. Now one former player who's right at home in the back 40 is former Flyers and Bruins goaltender Pete Peters. Since hanging up the pads, Pete has been enjoying life on the farm, as you'll see on After the Game. At a time when goal scorers ruled the hockey world, Pete Peters ranked as one of the best goaltenders of his day. During the 1980s, he twice led the league in goals against average. And in 1982-83, he led all goalies with 40 wins and eight shutouts to win the Vesna Trophy. However, Pete is probably best remembered as a member of the 1979-80 Flyers team that went undefeated for a record 35 consecutive games. You know, I think the older guys definitely knew what we were accomplishing and, and stepping towards. You know, I remember the night in Boston uh, when we tied it and uh, we come up with some huge goals by many different players on different nights. People rose to the occasion. And, uh, and then when we broke it in Buffalo, when I look back at it, in all honesty, I didn't feel that pressure. And I think it was because I was so young. Upon his retirement from the game in 1991, Pete headed back home to Edmonton where he and his wife run a family farm. He stays involved in the game as the Oilers goaltending coach. My dad, for a second job, used to work on a potato farm. Every time I could get out to that farm with him, uh, I was in his back pocket and I always remember him saying, well, you can come if you behave. <laughs> so I behaved quite a bit because I always wanted to go out there because I, I kind of like being out there walking with him through the rows of potatoes. They would grade potatoes and I'd be on the end of a pitchfork shoveling potatoes into the bin and uh, I enjoyed it. This is kind of the lifestyle that we wanted to bring our children up in. When I married Lori, I knew that this is probably we'd come back to the Nemeo area and try to find some area where we could uh, call home and uh, raise our kids and how it's evolved I mean I never thought it would evolve to you know kind of a little farm that we have but uh, we're enjoying it and uh, she's just so happy you know she loves her animals and the kids are happy and we all have her health so I think uh, that's all I can ask for. Coming away. We've got 35 cows that calve out each year. Uh, my wife has built her alpaca herd up to 12 now. She's, she's really trying to upgrade in breeding. But, uh, you know, that's what she loves to do. Hit the goal post. You know, I tell all the guys, I says, hey, I can't teach you how to stop the puck. God gave you the talent to put your hand or foot in front of it. I said, I can teach you lateral motion. I can teach you forward, backward motion. I can teach you how to play your angles, when to change your angles. But if I can make sure that a guy knows how to get from point A to point B when he wants to the quickest way possible and position his body the correct way, the rest is up to that individual. It's great to be able to go back in that dressing room with those guys and, and be a part of it even though you can't go out there and do what you used to do. And uh, the satisfaction out of that job comes is when I see these guys that I work with improve and if they can attain their goals, it's just to 
see them get to where they want to be and that maybe you had a little part in it. Be a Player gives you a chance to ask your favorite NHL player a question. For your chance to participate, visit NHLPA.com. Michelle Natohau of Prince Albert, Saskatchewan asked Michael Pekka, what would you have done if hockey wasn't your profession? Well, Michelle, thank you for the question. Uh, the answer is an architect. Uh, going through uh, high school, I uh, went through a lot of classes and took a lot of, uh, of alternate classes to, to ensure myself uh, that I wanted to be an architectural engineer. It was something I enjoyed doing. I loved uh, designing and building. Uh, you know, but, uh, it, and it's still something that I think I'd like to do uh, after my hockey's done. Sean goes for the big one, next. Is that my fly going to spook him? Yeah, the line will spook him. Oh my God. Got one. Time now for the Universal Music Hit Parade, featuring the Matthew Good Band and Load Me Up. Center, St. Louis. Parker, stop chance. Score! Time for Know Your Hockey, brought to you by Ford. Here's Craig Simpson. On a two-on-two -two rush, the defensemen should usually have an advantage. If they just play their man, they should be able to prevent a scoring chance. There is, however, a way for the forwards to give themselves an advantage, to crisscross in the neutral zone. The Red Wings get a great chance in the offensive zone by what they do in the neutral zone. Now, Steve Eisman, the puck carrier, is the key here. He feels pressure but knows that Brett Hall is going towards the boards. So Eiserman's going to take it right at the offside defenseman. By taking his man over towards the defenseman, he brings Eric Brewer into the middle of the ice. That creates some room to the outside. Now Brewer has a long way to go, and Rem Murray can't get to the puck carrier as well. That opens up a seam where Brett Hall makes a good pass, and the Red Wings almost score. Now in the neutral zone, if you don't have any speed, a crisscross like Igor Larionov's here gives Brett Hall the necessary room he needs to get a shot. By going right at the offside defenseman, Hall can come from the outside, and Tom Pody is forced to back up, and Brett Hall gets a great scoring opportunity. Now in the neutral zone, what you want to do is isolate the defenseman. Robert Lang is going to go right at the defenseman because he knows his partner is going to crisscross. That backs the defense off the line, gets the focus of the other defenseman, and allows the Penguins to come from behind and create a scoring chance. When you don't have any speed in the neutral zone, by crisscrossing, you make life very difficult for the defense, and you'll give yourself a scoring opportunity. Know Your Hockey, brought to you by Ford. Fishing has always been an important part of life in New England. For centuries, mariners have braved these waters chasing the big one. Let's hope I have my sea legs on as Sean McEachern and I try to reel one in on part two of our Be A Player profile. Derek, you ready to go? Like, yeah. Brett, how are you? Nice to see you. this? Yeah, you ready to go fishing? We are. Right. Derek, do you mind playing tour guide for a minute? Where, where are we and what, where are we headed? Sure, we're uh, leaving Manchester Harbor now. We're heading out into what they call Salem Sound. We're about a you know, half hour or so by water north of Boston. We'll probably see a ton of fish. Getting them to eat will be, a, be an interesting challenge. Now, how often do you get out? I mean, I know you're an avid fisherman. Well, I get on the boat. I get in the, go on the boat quite often, uh, mostly uh, tubing and going to the beach and stuff like that. But I try to get fishing once a week. And what uh, kind of fish typically would you be catching up? Uh, when if I'm you're catch catching, when I, if I catch any, usually I try to catch stripers and some bluefish. Anything I can catch is good for me. Check these rocks sort of behind us here, and work along this edge and cast up into the white water. We've got a nice swell today. See if we can't pull a couple bass out of there.
That's a great cast there, Sean. Thanks. Yeah, I'm struggling here. This is a mess. If my brother could see me now, he'd be so proud. All those years of fishing he taught me. And I got a nest. Chair How's this going up here? You should have brought a chair and an umbrella. I should have brought a chair and an umbrella. Yeah. You're, you're working it out over there. <laughs> I think McEachern's working way too hard up there. McEachern's going to be all bummed out when I land this big striper in a few seconds. You get one? <laughs> oh, that's not right. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is some action. Diving for that rock and bury me. Look at him go. Would you see the bobble go under? And yeah, the bobble, the bobble went under. <laughs> All righty. Whoops. Oh, I don't know. Would well, that be a technicality? That the of the <laughs> I got don't right. worry, I'll be on in two minutes again. <laughs> you just keep throwing that fly. I don't think it counts yet. You found the bait. You got to have it in the boat. Got one. Oh. 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 That was definitely a fish. Did I not set it? That was definitely a fish. I don't know. Ah. Not again. Yeah! <laughs> Listen to this guy go. See if he can land this one. Yeah, hopefully we'll get it semi in the boat. Oh yeah! <laughs> oh yeah! What's Little that? Fella? Is that nine pounds? Yeah, it's probably about eight pounds. Eight pounds? Or so, yeah. You always gotta add one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's gone. I'll catch another one. Five minutes. <laughs> Just give me five. Come on, Sean. Look at all that action. The pressure. It's getting to me. <laughs> Spooked. <laughs> Is that my fly going to spook him? Yeah, the line will spook him. Oh my god! <laughs> Got one. Nice. How's that feel? Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> That's about the only one we didn't spook, I guess. What's the, what's the difference between fighting on a fly rod? It's a lot harder? Yeah, a lot. They were caught on a fly yet. That's the first one. I think. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, here we go. <laughs> there we go. Elbow. <laughs> All right, kicks. <laughs> Look at this screen right now. All set. This guy's pretty pissed. Come here. I, I he's a little beat, guy. I don't think you beat him with the uh, size category, but. To me? Yeah. He's a little guy. Who's bigger? Ah, oh, uh, shoot. I think he got me. Well, I'm losing him. Oh, he's biting me now. Naughty fish. <laughs> Let's get some more. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. You got one? Yeah, I'm on. It's just a little one. It's a wee lad. Oh, now he's giving her. Oh, he's upset. Oh, I lost it. Uh, he wasn't talking very oh, hard at all. Come on, it was 20 pounds. 20 pounds, at least, 20. <laughs> got one. You got one? How's he feel? He feels little. Little? Yeah, right there. It's two more than I caught last time I went fishing. Good day. <laughs> Not bad at all. Make him look big. Turn him <laughs> like this, they look a little bit bigger. <laughs> Old trick. Well, guys, that was a lot of fun. Derek, great. appreciate the expertise today. Oh, Thanks a lot, Derek. Sean, great you did a great job with the fly rod. You did, Very great. Impressive. you did a nice job with the bobber and the bread, too. <laughs> <laughs> we have a good time. We caught some fish. I'm going to send that guy back yeah, to the sea. Yeah, we're going to send this guy back, let him get a little bit bigger. Find out if Mama's back there. Do you believe in miracles? Team USA, next. Obviously, there's going to be some pressure and some expectations to uh, you know, redeem ourselves, I guess, from Japan in 98. Be a player, sponsored by EA Sports NHL 2002. If it's in the game, it's in the game. Welcome back. This is where one of the most important journeys in American history began. On the evening of April 18, 1775, Paul Revere left his Boston home to warn Samuel Adams and John Hancock that the British troops are marching to arrest them. Now in a few weeks, the U.S. men's Olympic hockey team will travel to Salt Lake to try and make some history of their own. Here's a look at Team USA. If history and home ice advantage mean anything, the Americans have to be one of the favorites in Salt Lake. In 1960 and 80, the United States hosted the Winter Games and both times came away with hockey gold. This time, it won't be a ragtag group of college kids wearing the Stars and Stripes, but a team loaded with NHL veterans. I personally don't think it would be a miracle this time. You know, the, the core of this team has won you know, on the international stage before. You know, if we win, I, I wouldn't consider it a miracle by any means. The 
anytime you're in your homeland, uh, you know, it's going to be a little bit added pressure on you, and people are going to expect more. But also on the other uh, on the other foot, you got the crowd behind you, which I think is huge too. I hope we learn a lot from from the style of game we played uh, over in Japan. I think you have to play from a defensive base, and then take the skills of Madano uh, and Brian Leach and and uh, Kuchuk and Garen and Ronick and Wait and take their skills and go with it. Well, it's going to be exciting, no, no doubt about it. I think it's going to uh, really be uh, a lot of uh, anticipation leading up to it. I think there, obviously there's going to be some pressure and some expectations. Uh, you know, redeem ourselves, I guess, from Japan in 98 and come out and have a good show. And I think with obviously with everything that's happened in the world and in New York and Washington over the last three, four months, I think Leading into it, I think it'll be a great thing for America and for the fans and uh, give them something else to really uh, put their mind on. Via Player Trivia is brought to you by EA Sports NHL 2002. If it's in the game, it's in the game. Guys, the question, which two rookies led their teams in scoring last season? Two rookies around the league led their teams in scoring. Who were they? Die for shot. Uh, Hossa 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 wasn't rookie last year. No. no. Uh, I'm blank here. How about uh, Gaborik? Gaborik, Minnesota. And, uh, Not the guy in, in Tampa. I think I got one. No. Brad Richards? Very good. I was, was going to say that. Richards gets it to Kuba. Bouncing puck. Rebound. Score! Marion Gaborik! It's 5-4 Minnesota! Three on two for Tampa. Here's Brian Richards. Paul Mera heads to the net. Richards shot. He scores. Every April, the area where I'm standing serves as the finish line for the Boston Marathon, one of the most famous races in all of sport. Over 17,000 athletes come here to conquer the 26-mile, 385-yard course. Now it takes the best runners in the world a little more than two hours to complete the race. That's making me tired just thinking about it. I'd like to thank Sean McEachern for a great day out on the harbor. I'd like to thank you for watching. Make sure you catch next week's show as we'll preview Canada's Olympic team, something you won't want to miss. I'll see you next week. Brett Lindros's clothing supplied by The Coop, clothing for men, Toronto. NHLPA.com is your source for the latest stats, scores, and NHL player information. Click on Be a Player for the latest show information or to send us your questions and comments. You'll find it all at NHLPA.com. This week on Be a Player, join me and Sean McEachern from the Ottawa Senators. He doesn't need to yell. You don't need to yell, Brad. The yell. microphone is on the back. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a mic. Is that a mic? <laughs> that's a microphone, Brad. All right.